On this episode of Travelog, we reach the world's highest plateau and explore life from above. Brace yourself for a journey of a lifetime to the ancient land of Tibet, a place of mystery, adventure, and stunning beauty. Snow-capped mountains, lush green vegetation, bright sunshine, and the maddening people who reside on the roof of the world. The brave and devout. A journey to where nature is at her most magnificent and forbidding. To mysterious places where dazzling and diverse cultures flourish. Where China's numerous ethnic groups draw you into a world of color and vibrancy. Where distinct lifestyles, traditions, and crafts have survived the test of time. Join Travelog on its 17-part ethnic odyssey, visiting more than a hundred places across China. Ethnic Odyssey: An enlightened look at China's rich ethnic heritage. Landscape and diversity of its peoples. Welcome to Travelog's Ethnic Minority Special. If you think about the minority of China, perhaps the most mysterious of all are the Tibetans, and that's why today we are in Tibet. And this place right now is actually the birthplace of Tibetan culture. These mountains, this plateau, everything around me is where it all happened originally. So get ready for the adventure of a lifetime. Welcome to Travelog. I'm Yin. For most people, a journey to the Tibet Autonomous Region is a fantasy, something beyond their reach. For others, it's a lifelong dream that may just come true. And yet, for others, it's a mission that defines their very existence. We'll be drifting downstream on the Yalong River from the birthplace of Tibetan civilization, Shannan, as far as Linzhi, and onwards to the heart of Tibet, the capital Lhasa. On our journey, we're accompanied by tourists and Buddhists. Tibet, with its average altitude of 4,000 meters, is called the roof of the world. Everyone who travels here has their own unique reasons for doing so, from exploring the unknown to attaining enlightenment. Religion is the foundation of Tibetan culture. Buddhism first came to the region during the reign of Sun Zan Gampo in the seventh century. In the Tubuo Kingdom, he laid the foundation for Buddhism by importing scriptures and building monasteries. His other great achievement was to cement the ties between Han and Tibetan peoples, which he did by marrying the Tang Dynasty princess, Princess Wencheng. Today, Tibetans live in a land where past and present merge. From traditional yak butter tea to international fare, religious paintings to postmodern art, it's a bizarre mix unlike any other. But one thing that's unchanged is the spirit of the people. In Shannan, the birthplace of ancient Tibetan culture, there stands the first palace built by the first Tibetan king. That was in the second century. The Yongbalakan Palace is the oldest surviving example of Tibetan architecture. Wow! Look at the crops over here. These were where the first Tibetans settled over 2,000 years ago, and you see, it's believed that they came here. Had a Tibetan king and built 
their first palace. Maybe that's why this area is so sacred. Legend has it that the original ancestors of the Tibetans were a sacred monkey and a mortal woman. Over the centuries, their descendants multiplied and formed a tribe and turned the valley into agricultural land. After the first king descended to earth from the heavens, he was followed a little later by the first sacred text, which fell on the roof of his palace. Buddhism made its way into Tibet from India, and the central figure is Sakyamuni, the founder. Still today, a sign of devotion among Buddhists is to recite the sutras, spin prayer wheels, and offer yak butter lamp for the oil lamps. The Yumbalakhan Palace, geometric in shape, was the model based on which many other structures were later built. There's something magical about the towering place, perched on the mountain beneath the clouds and brilliant sun. Indescribable. Tibetans live in an area with an extensive river system and vast lakes. Naturally, they have learned to use these waterways as a means of transport. By tradition, small boats made of animal hide were used to cross those rivers. Although today's boats are a bit more sophisticated, the journey is no less difficult. After about 20 minutes, I'd say we're sort of stuck in the middle of the river. Surprisingly, the river is only like this deep. Look at this guy. He's pushing us over because of the, the sand. It's sort of stuck underneath. And we're, we're sort of slowly gravitating this way and then hopefully get back under the, the right path soon. Discovering the hidden wonders of Tibet is a real challenge. You'll need a car and a boat, along with some more rather interesting looking vehicles. And not forgetting your own two feet, of course. Dust, bright sunshine, and the unpredictable weather all add to the difficulties. But an adventurous spirit and some endurance are usually enough to open up a world beyond your imagination. Of course, the reward for this arduous trek is amazing. Samye Monastery, built in the 8th century, was the first monastery in Tibet. It was commissioned by an Indian Buddhist master and combines elements of Han, Tibetan, and Indian architecture. And thus, it's called the Three Style Temple. It's one of the most popular destinations for pilgrims, some of whom travel on foot for weeks to reach it. Ground floor is Tibetan, middle floor is Han, and the top is in Indian style. Sanya Monastery is particularly famous mostly because of its grand scale and also its position as the oldest and earliest monastery containing all three religions. And you see, the name in English sort of translates into the unimaginable monastery. And that's because when it was first being built, it was unimaginable how huge this place was. And also, after it was being slowly constructed, it was being taken down by the demons every night. But somehow, miraculously, it still came to be what it is today. 
An air of mystery surrounds Samya Monastery, enhanced by its grandiose and complex design. It's supposed to replicate the universe as described in the sutras. Four towers, each of different color, stand at the four angles of the main temple. They symbolize the four heavenly kings who are said to protect and bless the monastery. The monastery's interior is large and colorful. It's a place where many monks come to study, but there's one room we're not allowed to see. It's where monks of the highest standing spend three years studying the scriptures, and they don't come out until their time is up. Food is delivered to them regularly. Here, the wall paintings are most informative. For instance, this one displays the rules of the monastery. They're quite particular about the types of shoes allowed inside. Also, the type of kettle used for carrying the water, and the rules for praying. Daily ritual for monks is debating the Buddhist scriptures. It's a way for the novices to learn. The debate also serves as a test by which a ranking can be drawn up of how much the monks have mastered the rules of the Buddha. A must for all Tibetans over the world is to make a trip to this temple right here. And if you come here, one thing you must do is pray in front of this door. You see, this door is supposed to be the gateway to heaven. And if you look inside this little hole here, you'll be able to see your future. I'm going to take a look. <laughs> Tibetans from all over the world will come here, and they always leave a personal token. Sometimes it's a picture, sometimes it's written, or it may be something of more practical use. Beside the door hang two leather bags. Visitors leave a hair in one of them as a token that they reserve their place on the path to heaven. For Tibetans, death is not something to be feared. Rather, like life, it's a process to be experienced and passed through. <laughs> Next, we head to Linjir in the southeast of Tibet, where the altitude is 3,000 meters, much lower. At this milder climate, we find very unique greenery. The land here is nurtured by the Niyang River, a branch of the Yaluzangpu. The scenery is beyond the imagination of anyone who's not seen it. Forests, rich vegetation, and small villages nestled among the snow-capped mountains. This is the rich southern Tibet. A holy lake, Basung Tua, is also found here, whose waters give a reflection as good as any mirrors. Legend has it that two young lovers who are unable to be together in life dived into the lake, and in doing so, made it even more beautiful. is also famous for its picturesque communities. I decided to visit Walnut Village, so named because of the walnut trees that surround it. It's just the place to get a glimpse of what Tibetan life is really like.
Yes, we've seen many types of prayer wheels. Those that are spun by the hand, those that are spun by the wind, and now we see one that is spun by water power. Wow. Each time it spins, it's like reading the scriptures. Spinning the prayer wheel is believed to spread spiritual blessing and well-being. But there are many different ways of doing so. Water is also used to power the local barley mill to make the staple food here, zamba. After the barley is ground into very fine flour, it's mixed with a little tea and then rolled up into small lumps and eaten with the fingers. This crop is as important to them as rice and bread to us. From Ninja, we continue to Lhasa, the heart of Tibet, and for centuries, a destination by Buddhist pilgrims. Still today, people head there in droves, by bike, by road vehicle, and even on hands and feet. The journey can take weeks or even months. Incidentally, Lhasa in Tibet means place of God. In Lhasa, there are signature structures. It's famous for the Patala Palace and also the Jokhang Monastery, which are in the center of the old city. The religious influence here is very strong, and every year the city really comes alive during the Shotan Festival. I got up at 3 a.m. this morning in order to get in line for the festival. I climbed up the mountain for half an hour, and finally it's my turn to buy a ticket. <laughs> An important part of Shotan Festival is to visit the giant painting of the Buddha above Drepung Monastery. People start climbing the mountain as early as 2 a.m. in order to get the best view. So, hello, my name is Vincent. I'm from Holland. I will love to present people with the culture, tradition, and in uh, Suezuan, we also love the Chinese people, and in, uh, just hoping that the world of peace will come together. Um, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Slowly, the first glimmer of light smiles upon the land, and on a city with more than 1,400 years of history. Song Zan Gambo moved his capital to Lhasa from Shannan in the 7th century. According to historical records, he built the city specially for the Tang Dynasty princess he married. For her part, she brought a statue of Sakyamuni to Lhasa with her, and the Jokhang Monastery was built to house it. This effectively made the monastery the heart of the city. Today, it's still its spiritual center. But now, near Drepung Monastery, we are soon enveloped in mulberry smoke as well as the sound of horns and of scriptures being recited. A group of lamas, over a hundred of them, are pulling the 30-meter painting up to the platform. Originally, the festival was purely religious. Monks would spend weeks in retreat. When they emerged, it was the custom for commoners to give them yogurt. Hence the festival's name, Shotan, meaning yogurt.
And so, the giant picture of Sakyamuni, the founder of Buddhism, is revealed. For Tibetans, this is the cornerstone of their religion. And they will offer Hada, a silk white cloth, a symbol of purity and devotion, and walk around the mountain, hoping to be blessed. The painting of the Buddha is shown only once every year. For all Tibetans, this is a magical moment, a connection that can't ever fully be explained, but can be felt rooted in their hearts. In the afternoon, the activities move to Lobulinka. Tibetans are traditionally a nomadic and herding people, and thus many families will camp out here for a few days, getting back to their roots. Here, they chat with friends, enjoy some yogurt, and watch the traditional opera. Living in tents is a must. <laughs> Tibetans live in vastly different styles. In the high altitude north, there are no trees, so the nomadic people live in tents. In farming communities, they live in mud brick houses. In southeast Tibet, where there are plentiful forests, they live in wood homes. And also in Lhasa, people live in modern homes. Families sing songs that tell stories of their past. And on this festive occasion, Tibetans dressed in their best will gather together and watch a Tibetan opera, which is based on Buddhist teachings and Tibetan history. It's so important to their culture that the name for Shotan Festival is also Tibetan Opera Festival. The performances last for about a week during the holidays. Tibetan opera dates back 1,400 years, almost the dawn of Tibetan civilization. It's a combination of dance, chants, songs, and masks. legends or stories. To an outsider, Tibet can seem inscrutable and rather distant. However, its mystery and beauty never fail to leave an indelible impression on those daring enough to come and look. And there we have it. That is Tibet. It's a place where modernity and the tradition blend together. A mix of past and present. It's a place where the Tibetans live and many others come from all over the world. 
I'm Yin, and see you next time on our special. Bye-bye. On the next episode of Travelogue, come to Yushu for a closer look at the Tibetans of Qinghai on Horse Racing Festival. You gotta see it to believe it. Yeah,